everybody. I'm Paul Spence from King's College London and welcome to this seminar today on current trends in digital East Asian studies hosted by the Digital Model Languages Seminar, which I co-convene with Naomi Wells from the Institute for Modern Languages Research. The event today was inspired by a number of factors, including numerous initiatives in the last few years to counter the often Anglo-centric nature of Western digital studies and the significant growth of digital humanities in East Asia itself, which has long been active, but which is under-recognized in international community and publishing fora for digital studies. I convene the master's program in digital humanities at King's College in London, which has a number of East Asian students. And thanks to them, I'm constantly reminded of the different ecosystems, challenges and experiences which color our view of digital studies and research, depending on our locale and linguistic perspectives. Uh, the Digital Model Languages Seminar, which Nomi and I convene, aims to bring together and raise the visibility of model languages research, which engages with digital culture, media and technologies. It was made possible thanks to funding by the UK Art and Humanities Research Council's Open World Research Initiative. And the seminar series aims to create dialogue with researchers from sister fields, such as area studies, linguistics, digital humanities, digital cultural studies, and other fields interested in the intersections between languages, cultures, and digital methods. So with the event today, we hope to reflect on the achievements of the field of digital East Asian studies in recent years, and to discuss ongoing challenges, both in the methods and knowledge infrastructures, which it requires or, or constructs, and in the implications this brings to geocultural and linguistic diversity in digital studies. And we've got four excellent speakers today who are Jing Chen from Nanjing U University, Hilda Devert from Leiden, Leiden University, Sui Lik Hang from City University of Hong Kong, Kiyonori Nagasaki from International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo. And I'll introduce them all properly in a moment, but just to give you a sense of the, the structure for today, we'll start off with four presentations of 10 minutes each. We'll then follow that with an open discussion session where we hope you will field questions for our panel to respond to. And so I'm gonna invite our first panelist to uh, present now. This is uh, Seijie Chen, Jing Chen from Nanjing University. Uh, Jing Chen is an associate professor in the School of Art there. Um, and her research focuses on image and new media studies, especially visually, uh, visual knowledge production and digital media transformations. She's been publishing on DH on digital humanities in Chinese and English since 2013. She's an editorial member of digital humanities journals such as International Journal of Digital Archiving and Digital Humanities hosted by Tsinghua University and Digital Humanities Research hosted by Renmin University of China. And she's also the executive editor of a book series on digital humanities in China and a co-founder and co-editor of Zero One Lab, a Chinese academic blog on digital humanities on WeChat with over 7,000 followers. So over to Jing Chen, thank you. Hey, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks to Paul and Zanami for inviting me to uh, join this wonderful event. And, uh, I will start to share my screen and so everyone can see it, right? So, yeah, it's very, you know, good opportunity to talk about digital Asian studies because the, for the first question Paul received in the email is about achievement, right? So the first reaction in my mind, crossing my mind is at least we don't have to define the age every time when we do a conference or lecture in China now. At least in you know, the digital humanities became a popular term in academia. So people, no matter how much they understand about this term or concept, at least they know it's a thing. It's something they need or it's worthy of knowing. And so for this uh, for this event, digital Asian studies just recalled, made me recall a conference I attended in 2018. The title is Digital Humanities Asia. I think Helder was there, right? And Lincoln was supposed to go. And, <laughs> but it's very interesting because the end of this conference, the host asked a question about uh, how we take um, or how we think about the differences or connections between the digital China and Asia. So that was an interesting question to me because in my mind, at least in China, in the mainland of China, there's no such kind of Asian studies because we're in Asia. So 
we do the digital or studies or digital humanities, but we never question ourselves if it is a kind of a China study or Asian studies. So that was a very interesting question to me. And I started to think about why we should emphasize the differences or all this question really matters. After you know that conference during the past few years, Lincoln and I, we wrote several essays together in Chinese and in English, especially for the English ones. After we submitted to the reviewers, we always asked by the reviewers questions like, what's the uniqueness of digital humanities in China? What's the differences between the you know, Chinese digital humanities and American digital humanities or just the digital humanities? So that, that's very interesting because why should we different? Why should we? You know, it's something like when we are dealing with the digital technology, applying such kind of methods and the software to humanities studies, but why should we be different? At least in people's impression, they think there are some differences. But the answer to me is very clear because, because we're dealing with Chinese languages, we're dealing with Chinese texts, and also the objects in Chinese context. So everything is different. All the research methods or results are different from other, you know, countries' contexts. But but still, we have to think about so even just like the second question or third question. It's about the uh, different terms or different methods. When even they are kind of mutual in technology uh, world, but still, when we use them in a different context they are different and for the achievements for the four questions the first one is about achievements uh i just uh, took a very quick look at the healthy you know, slides when she was doing a testing i think she made a really comprehensive structure about all the events and the conf you know conferences lectures uh happened in the past few years Lincoln and i also wrote two essays about this one so i will left the heavy and the juicy part to them and uh, uh, I just want to say a little bit about this achievement. It's really good to, 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 at least to know at least we have a lot of people in Chinese academia started to do a research on hum digital humanities. At least now they call themselves as scholar of digital humanities or DHR. So that's a big change. Because I still remember like 2014, I went to Taiwan for a conference. So there was a big challenge from the traditional scholar. They're still asking why we need the digital humanities for humanities studies. And at the time, my colleague, I remember very clearly, he was very humble and answered to the traditional scholar like, okay, we just some scholars doing exactly the same thing as you because we know some new technology and the method. That's all. Now, actually people change their ideas. They started to call themselves you know, digital humanities scholars. They gave their new ideas. So I think this credits, this kind of a new identity is very important. For the second one, the challenge, but also it's a kind of a possibility here in the mainland of China is the new humanities strategy. It's a campaign launched by the Central Ministry of Education last year, I think. Lincoln, correct me if I was wrong. So uh, last year, so we called it Xin Wen Ke. So even at the beginning, everyone was guessing what's the meaning of the new humanities. You know, it's it seems nonsense, right? So, but for the central government, I think they want to find another competitive term to new engineering, new science, new medical, you know, science, something like this. So they want to make change of the humanities. They realize the challenge for the humanities research and education, because we are also losing students at the graduate school. We're also facing the job in the market, lacking more and more humanities positions, especially for the new IT industry. 
they more like you know the the companies IT companies like uh, students who uh, can do the data analysis. They don't want to have someone you know studying history or literature. That kind of a diet you know already that you know uh, uh, disciplines. So I think that's a really big you know challenge for um, Chinese humanities scholars, especially for the digital humanities. Because we have to give an answer to our government or to our universities. As a faculty, we started at least at the Nanjing University. We started to think about how we can use this kind of strategy and campaign to develop the digital humanities, to make the digital humanities as the answer to the new humanities. So that's what we're doing here. And also, I think that's probably for the Chinese context, that would be a kind of new potential for digital humanities develop, especially for uh, how to make the digital humanities as a aging discipline could be accepted by the central or mainstream, uh, you know, mainstream uh, educational uh, discipline or the institutes. The third question, yeah, there are different terms about the digital humanities in China. I think the Lincoln, the healthy know more about the quantitative history and digital history debates, right? So because that's, it has, it has been long time for people to, to discuss about what's the differences between them. But for the information science and the library science, so they do more like a digital library. And for the architecture and the landscape designing display, they started to use the spatial humanities. Uh, but it's very interesting. I want to give a case about my field. You know, the art history is the most conservative field in humanities. Yeah, and they don't like change at all. So last year, I used this title, the Digital Art History, to apply for the national grant. And fortunately, I passed the, all the blend, you know, preview um, for the mailing um, review process. I passed, but uh, at the end, on the table of the several powerful uh, reviewers, someone actually told me later, because of some really powerful one asked them a question like, Oh, what is digital art history? You know, digital is such kind of new things. Should we talk about history already? You know, so it's very funny to see the people still, they don't think the digital or digital technology, it's already something influenced the uh, research field. They more like to think the digital technology is too new to be accepted by the uh, research or the, by the disciplines. So that's my experiences. And uh, I will do the application again this year, but you know, my colleagues already recommended, suggested me to change the title because the same people, so a group of people, reviewers will be at the table again. Okay, so at the, uh, at the end, I want to just give a very simple case study because it's about the neutral language. When we talk about the languages, we're always thinking about tax, right? Because I'm doing art, I'm doing the handicraftsmanship. So I want to do something like color because color is also kind of a general languages. And we used to think about that, you know, in the uh, text analysis or the image recognition or something. Uh, so I will change my screen to, to share a new one or uh, how many minutes I still have? Two? If I, it's really short, I will just, just okay. Yeah, so anyway, I, I will stay with this one. Okay, good. So, uh, so this is the image about the old, you know, the Qing Dynasty uh, gone. It's a, uh, it uh, belonged to the emperor of the Qing Dynasty, and now it's archived and reserved at the uh, palace, the Forbidden Palace in the museum. And the funny thing is, like, we want to know what the color of this, you know, closest is, and uh, then we need to, in order to figure out which color it is, we have to do a textile analysis. But for the Chinese traditional color, uh, especially for the closest, they were used to dye by the plants. 
So we have to do analysis to find out which kind of plant, you know, used for the Asian people, for the old people to die, you know, closest to die the silks. And so we found some old, you know, uh, plants and we made a chemical analysis to care, you know, if this one textile really uh, was the color like yellow. And uh, then we did, uh, you know, those kind of hand, you know, dying by ourselves because we have to repeat all the Asian skills to find out how the Asians. And then we made those kinds of color in the packs. But the funny thing is like, because we didn't have those kind of Pantone, you know, our you know, color system, or we don't have those kind of standard of a color numbers. So we have to use the uh, kind of digital equipment to digitize the color and we had to follow the CIE LAB system. So that's very important because only with those kinds of a system, the international general uh, and the general color standard, then we can explain to people which color it is. Otherwise, it's really hard for people to understand or to know which color it is because now in China, for the different all and all industrial, you know, business, no matter it's a silk dyeing or the you know handicraftsmanship, they all use the Western Western or international standards of a color like LAB, LCH, and also like HCV. All those kind of things are based on the Western color system. So we always say the color is the. the general language for the global you know uh, society something like that but actually it's not true because there's so many colors in chinese text and uh you know uh, craft uh, ships actually even the chinese people now cannot recognize them anymore and then we after we dye those silks and we digitize the color we have to convert all those kinds of numbers into the color space and uh, uh, convert those kind of traditional color into the international standard to make the people the modern people to understand it and but still we have to follow the experiences of the handicraftsmen and so uh, we have to uh, negotiate with them to ask them what kinds of a color they can recognize from those kind of color space. But but it's really hard. It's not easy because for them, for those kind of trained eyes of the handicraftsmen, they didn't know what is Western color system, but they know exactly what this closest looks like. So for those kind of things, it's it's a kind of a translation of the color languages to them. So we have to explain to them why we want to do that. We have, we, why did we have to do it? Because we want to make those kind of color um, in, interpretable. And especially for this one, for the left one, the image was the old color, uh, the color of the old clothes. But after the translation and the converting, so we can find out exactly what's the real color of this clothes thousand years ago. So that's the case, very simple case, but it's a big project. I collaborated with the um, and statistics, uh, mathematics, and also the uh, local handicraftsmen. Uh, but it's very interesting because every time when we talk about the same, you know, the color, you know, question to other people in the different countries. I think they are facing the same thing, quite a similar situation. Because what we are dealing in digital humanities, especially in the kind of academia, normally we deal with those kind of texts, right? Texts and the images, they are flat. They are not physically um, occupied by something. So it's more like uh, flat things. So everything can be scanned easily or um, not that easily, I know, but still uh, much easier than the uh, uh, physical objects. So especially three dimension things. So I think that's probably uh, for art, you know, world for the art studies, uh, we have to think about is there a, another kind of languages we should consider. 
So that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for a fascinating presentation. And it's a relief to hear that we're uh, increasingly not having to explain what digital humanities is in, in, in other parts of the world. That's always good news to hear. And um, the, the, I'm particularly interested in your comments at the end about color. I was talking about color yesterday in a class. Uh, we talked about the universal, universal, universality of icons and color, and it's a very, very interesting point. So, and then and, and a very interesting perspective on the, um, the diversity uh, challenges here. So we'll open for questions later on, but I'm now going to, um, and that gives me pleasure to move on to our next speaker, um, who's Hilda Devert from Leiden University. Hilda's a professor of Chinese history at Leiden University. Uh, she's currently working on a long durée global history of Chinese political advice literature. She's published three volumes on medieval Chinese political culture and intellectual history, and her latest publications include an edited translation titled The Essentials of Governance, published by Cambridge University Press last year, and A Comparative History of European and Chinese Political Culture, published by Amsterdam University Press in 2021. She maintain, maintains an active interest in designing and developing digital research methods for East Asian languages, and with Brent Hoshi's co-designed Marcus, and with Ms. Helene, Comparativists, and I'll pass over now to Hilda. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Paul and Naomi, for uh, including me and for for setting up this this conversation. It's also great to see uh, lots of people uh, from the past with whom we we have been talking about this uh, amongst the participants. Um, I hope you can see my screen all right and that you can hear me all right. Is that right? Okay, so then I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. I'll try to stick to that, but Naomi, please feel free to uh, send me a reminder. So I decided, I want to make sure I can go through the slides, um, to, to really stick to the questions. I, I really hope that you, you check back on the website. I think Paul and Naomi put together, I think, a really good set of questions for us to work with and, and to think through. Um, and I, I did what I, used, what I used to do actually first at, at, uh, at King's many years ago, uh, and that is to put together an outline for myself with some key points that are at least perhaps key positions that I have on, on those questions. Uh, I hope they're somewhat uh, visible. I've sort of sliced them down per question in the hope uh, that this can also be um, sort of where we can start the conversation later on. So the first question was, what, what have been the main scholarly achievements of digital East Asian studies in recent years? And I think this is a good starting point to sort of think about what, what have we accomplished so far that then can also lead to sort of a critical reflection on perhaps, you know, well, how could we do this differently? I think in some ways uh, we are not exceptional, but, but I think we can pat ourselves on the shoulder in the sense that uh, very early on, already in uh, the 90s of the 20th century and, and onwards since then, um, we have been working on textual, biographical, geographic database, the, the databases that were based on reference tools that have been standard in the field. And that means that at this point, we have a lot of material to work with that we can build on. I think we can all think of examples given the limited time we have, I, I have not gone into examples, but this, this goes for Chinese studies as well as Japanese studies, as well as Korean studies. And so I think when I talk about East Asia, uh, those are the main ones also including Taiwan, of course, that I will be uh, focusing on. Um, in a second step, mainly in a second step, people have also been building tools and platforms using some of these uh, databases that we have. And when I say people, I'm really talking about a broad range of entities uh, that have participated uh, in this. Governments have been important players. This is true for China, for Taiwan, for Korea, uh, for, for Japan. Uh, libraries have been important, academic as well as public libraries. Um, research organizations, but also private individuals, uh, researchers and uh, commercial organizations have played an important role in developing databases, but also in beginning to work uh, on tools and, and platforms. And I wanna highlight particularly also the, the contributions of individuals or, or small groups of, of researchers, because I think this is something uh, that um, is, is perhaps definitely not unique, but it has been uh, an important part of, of a new kind of collaboration. If you think of Donald Sturgeon's work, work in Chinese studies, C-Text, uh, our work, and Marcus and Comparativus, 
Um, I think what is important here is that we have seen attempts from scholars to sort of say, well, take our research flows into account when developing these databases and these tools. And so we see the beginning of collaborations with librarians, but also with companies, sort of ensuring that they're not just working with their own sets of priorities, but that they take into account how scholars and how students work or would like to work because I think there's still work work to be done here uh, but that is is definitely I think when we look back one of the perhaps more valuable things uh, that that we have been doing in the past 10 years or 20 years or so the next step and I think this is something that's very much still in its initial steps is for people to look at how can we then ensure that these various platforms these various da various databases that we have been working on really talk to each other so that you don't have to pick one or the other, but that you can actually combine the strengths of those to do your work. And the best example that I know of in, in this particular regard is uh, the uh, collaboration between the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin and the Max Planck and, and, and Leiden, uh, Rise and Shine. The idea there is that you don't come up with sort of a top-down infrastructure that everybody should use, but that you try to, first of all, create textual repositories of different kinds, open access, commercial, uh, and that you allow people to search across those, define a set of text or data or images that you want to work with, and then allow people to select what tools you then want to continue working with. And that could be linking to markers, it could be linking to CTEXT, to DocuSky, an important Taiwanese um, text analysis platform. And then in a final step, to produce a report or data that can then be put in a repository where it can again be shared or repurposed. Um, the whole idea is not there yet because of course this is very challenging work, setting up the collaboration to start out with the technical challenges uh, in addition. But it is, I think, one of the important things that we have to be doing uh, and that as researchers, we typically do not want to work with one set of uh, texts coming from one database, or one provider, and one set of tools. We tend to want to use what we think um, works best and what comes from various uh, sources to answer our questions. Then when we look back, I think an important thing to keep in mind is, is that 10 years ago, or even five years ago, I would be telling a different story. But what we have seen in the last couple of years is a rapid expansion of digital research and I'm, I'm not only talking about development i talk about people publishing uh integrating uh research flows that are really taking advantage of, of digital um ways of uh working with with text and images uh and we see this because well by now it's it, it's it, we have regular uh, conferences and events in all of the areas in east asia but also in europe in america on uh, digital East Asian studies. We have newly developed programs and centers. There are only still a few at this point. It's uh, important to keep that in mind. Mainly in East Asia, we don't really have sort of institutionalized uh, programs and, and centers uh, in Europe or America. Uh, but we also see a rapid expansion of East Asian language journals and digital humanities. Almost every year, there's a new one. Uh, and, and I think an important trend, this is also just the last couple of years, we've seen from major journals in the field of digital humanities broadly that they want to globalize, that they want to include Chinese, Japanese, Korean uh, research in uh, digital humanities as well. Within that as well, and I think this is also recent, we see a diversification of uh, East Asian digital uh, research, uh, perhaps slightly um, different note here from what Chen King has, has been saying. I think before we saw sort of people wanting to do digital humanities and, and put a special issue together, now we see that major journals in the field, in Chinese history and religious studies, in literature, also art and architecture's beginning, uh, media studies, that they simply put on special um, volume, special issues together on specific topics or in the broader field of, of digital methods. Uh, or the digital and so on. Uh, beginning still uh, is, is also not to just focus on special issues, but also to think about how can we change monograph in, in that regard and make it interactive. Uh, an excellent example there is, is Tom uh, Mullaney's work from, from Stanford. There are few examples of this, of course. Here, here we're just really uh, looking at things that are starting, but I think they're good examples to, to, to work with. 
Um, and our last but not least, I think, for this first question, uh, there is a strong sense of community, uh, right? That, that um, if, if you look, if you want to know something about this field, it's very easy to find out what's, what's, what's there at this point. And there's social media groups on all of the important uh, platforms in East Asia, as well as uh, in, in English uh, languages or European languages. There's overviews of tools and projects, wikis, open methods by, by Alice Horvath and others, a Google Docs uh, um, initiative by Paula Curtis. Uh, so there, there, there is a lot that um, people have put together to sort of ensure that this, this um, field has, has some visibility and is easily accessible for an otherwise somewhat fragmented uh, community. I also want to mention the great podcast, Amanda Schumann, uh, and um, other centers have been putting up uh, as well. On to the next question, then, what, what are the, the main challenges for the field? And, and I, I thought this, this question, I, I think, put it very well that challenges come in various guises. Yeah, they're organizational problems, they're uh, not problems, challenges at least, epistemological ones, as well as technical ones to, to think through. And I've, I've listed some of those here. I'll have to sort of quickly point to those, but I'm happy to sort of elaborate on some of this in the question and answer period. There are clearly organizational challenges for uh, East Asian digital uh, humanities. I think some of these are shared within digital humanities more generally, but I think it, it really applies doubly for us, um, especially for, and when I say us, I am of course mainly looking at this as someone who's located in, uh, in the Netherlands, in this case, working on uh, East Asia, China in particular, or Chinese history. Locate, locating expertise locally is, is a real challenge. Um, most of us sit in, in area studies or in discipline specific departments and, and finding people to work with and for any aspect of digital humanities can really be a challenge, um, particularly because of there is always this, I, 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 Chen, uh, Chen Jing rightfully mentioned this, that this idea is that somehow we must be different and there's sort of a fear reaction, right? So we can't deal with you because you're working with Chinese. So, uh, and, and in most cases, this is, this is really uh, not necessary. Um, our collaboration so that most of my collaborators, Mace Helene is an example, do not know Chinese. Uh, this is not a problem. You can still develop within this field even if you don't know the language. Uh, you, of course, have to work with people uh, who do. Sharing expertise locally can be a challenge as well, and that uh, this has a lot to do with uh, the way higher ed, ed is organized. But even if you find people, they may not be able to work with you because, well, they are working in a different department, and you know that uh, that is a problem. So um, the the technical challenges, on the whole, I, I will mention them. They're there, but I think to me they're they're probably given too much attention <laughs> in terms of uh, people worrying about whether or not this, this could be part of how we think about uh, digital research methods. Uh, a few examples, language, of course, does matter. Uh, I think uh, when we developed Comparativus, we developed it by default with East Asian languages in mind, where you know we were character by character. If you apply the same logic to English and Dutch, for example, and, and all other European language, you, you would ruin your, uh, your system if, if you want to do comparisons like this. Um, you have to change the parameters. But that's all there is to it. It's what we did when we developed comparativism is then later ensuring, because my collaborator is a classicist, it could work for Latin and Greek too. You just have to change the parameters and you have to know this ahead of time. Um, but it's, it's, it can be done, of course. It just requires some knowledge of how these languages uh, work. Um, the embedding and scholarship can also be a, a challenge uh, somewhat. And that is, and by, th by that I mean that when uh, engineers develop uh, databases for companies, for example, um, they uh, oftentimes don't have a good sense as to what is out there already that they could use. Um, and, and in some ways, they're limiting what we could what we could do because of this. Uh, if we were to use the geographic databases, the the, um, the dictionaries that already exist, uh, we could be doing far far better work. So I'm, I'm mentioning that in a sense, it's not a real technical problem. It's it's, it's a problem of not taking on board things that are there in technical development. Um, a, a real challenge, I think, for all of us who are actually developing things is to keep up with new developments and standards, but also in, in these fields. Right? Machine learning is, is, is a good example. We did a module early on in Marcus, but this has to be rewritten time and again and added on to, uh, and, and that is a real challenge, of course. 
uh, and the medium term sustainability of services. Again, that if, if you want to offer a service, and I think this is important still in the digital humanities, just putting something in a, in a repository doesn't work really at this point for, for us. So offering a service is key, but ensuring sustainability, uh, convincing libraries to work with that is, is difficult. Um, there, of course, are also when we work in a global uh, environment doing our work, uh, there are also challenges relating to the governance of the Internet. Uh, we have this certainly when working on, on Chinese sources that, uh, and also the other way around, by the way, that getting access to databases uh, developed in China can at times be quite difficult uh, because they're so slow. And we get this with Marcus, so you have to set up a mirror sign, for example. Uh, outreach on, multi on social media has to happen through multiple uh, and parallel uh, channels. Uh, this is probably a situation that is relatively um, more challenging, I would say, in, in our context. Um, but not exclusively, so I think there are other areas in the world where that would apply to. Epistemological challenges, I think, are there as well. Uh, and that is that, I mean, to me, there's sort of two of uh, very broadly defined, that is, uh, we are still struggling, I think, within digital humanities broadly defined, but also within uh, East Asian digital humanities, with the question of how to relate uh, computational quantitative approaches with uh, theoretical approaches. And, and the second one that I mentioned there is we, we're still struggling with how to relate humanities concerns and workflows with natural or social, social science models. Um, and, and I think this is probably something that, that should be foregrounded more in that I think we have both of those. It's important to mention that. Uh, we, we have people certainly on the, on, on the more theoretical side of things, uh, Asiascape, a uh, journal uh, edited by my colleague, Florian Schneider, that is about the digital in Asia, for example, is there. But oftentimes these, these two worlds don't meet. And I think it's critical for both sides. It's very important. Uh, I also say this because I see sometimes what you develop has theoretical assumptions. And when people start using it without engaging with those, uh, you see sometimes things that actually, yes, uh, make my blood boil and, and my heart beat, uh, not in a good way. So I, I, I think it is really important that, that this, this is foregrounded more on, on both sides. Um, and, and the same that, uh, that this latter concern, I think, is critical because we have learned that we oftentimes want to do different things when we work digitally. And being able to, to work with, um, uh, with the developers to ensure that, that the humanities concerns get the visualizations they want, the, the analysis uh, that they think are appropriate is, is critical. On to uh, the third uh, question, um, how do the different regional interpretations of digital humanities in the region uh, and institutional embeddings of East Asian studies outside the region facilitate or complicate collaborative research? It's a big question. I think it's, also, it's almost three components that each would deserve uh, their uh, sustained attention, but I'm, I'm just going to highlight two points here. Um, the as I already mentioned, the sort of the disimbalance uh, between computational and theoretical strands, I think, is, is something to address. And it's something that I, I think particularly also applies to, to the, the East Asian uh, part of uh, the story. And I think there we could make a collaborative effort to really um, uh, you know, attract more attention to this question in both teaching and in, in research for uh, um, and, and to think about this, this question. It's one that I that I throw out there. So how can we encourage more extensive engagement with theoretical concerns in, in our work? And my, my main point here uh, relating to this question is that regardless of these challenges, I think we, we, have, um, we have to benefit from strengthening collaboration, even under difficult circumstances sometimes. Uh, I think we, the challenges that we have there in, in uh, particularly strengthening international collaboration is that in all instances, I would say this for the Netherlands just as well as for China, Taiwan or Japan or Korea, that um, the, the big investments have been national in focus. And this has its benefits, but it also has major drawbacks. I think it has major limitations in terms of uh, facilitating how we, we work. Uh, there's also different regimes of control over data. Data security, again, applies for all regions, right? So privacy laws are different in each of these regions, making it sometimes very difficult to develop things for, for an international um, audience. Um, 
I think the other challenges there are, of course, the things that we're familiar with in academia, inter-organizational competition, this goes for East Asia again, as well as, as, as for Europe. And commercialization uh, can be a challenge, doesn't have to be. There, there too, I think it's, it's finding the right answer to the question of how, how to collaborate that's, that's important. But perhaps briefly to highlight this, we, as well as uh, one of our main partners in the China Biographical Database, have collaborated with a Chinese company, for example. Uh, so th this can work. Uh, uh, but so the, the main point here is that if, if we want to improve the situation, the idea is that we still have to be part of the story, not to withdraw, but to, to strengthen uh, joint projects, international and international, of course, in this case, oftentimes means multilingual efforts. And this is why it's important. And uh, I, I think in all, of these, in all of these national projects, the problem is that they tend to be narrow in scope, not multi, multilingual. Um, so I think this, this fourth question that's really about international standards versus the regional uh, localized approaches is one that I, I think you'll know you will have a lot more to say about than I do, having been part uh, of this. I'm, I'm going to uh, be very brief on this one. I think it's clear that um, th there has been a sustained effort in ensuring the presence of major as well as smaller uh, and historical languages, so think about Tangut, um, uh, Tibetan, Manchu, and, and so forth, also becoming part of this. So there, there are very few excuses not to include these languages by now. There are Unicode standards for all of these, so, so uh, it, it's, it's possible to develop with those languages in mind as well. Uh, but on the whole, and I think this is this is an important problem, I think there's poor integration in large scale European infrastructures of these languages. And the point that I've, I've tried to make in various forums, not always, I think, successfully, but I'll, I'll keep repeating it never, nevertheless, is that we have to ask ourselves what counts as the European language, right? To me, all of these languages, these East Asian, what we call East Asian languages, are also European languages in the sense that they have been spoken, written, and published in Europe for a very long time and that they have substantial communities operating in these languages. And so if, if we want to even look, look at the national uh, or, or European scale, we have to include these languages because we have those materials coming from uh, out of Europe. Uh, as well. So, so this is certainly my hope in, in doing this work that um, we will not focus on, on selective European languages in developing at a national or European level. Um, there's pros and cons of regional approaches. I think there's, we, we have to not always be dismissive of people not applying all the standards that are out there. In some cases, local design and local uh, approaches have the advantage of really sort of working for a local community uh, uh, that is used to certain ways of looking at things and certain ways of working. And you definitely see this in, in some uh, development in, uh, in East Asia. Um, and then sometimes this can be very creative. There's cons, of course, and that uh, this means that uh, you can only do certain things. And, and I think one of my main criticisms there is that sort of bilingual, multilingual research, translation research, really hasn't gotten any attention in those fields, even though we know they're actually really important <laughs> for, for this is something that everybody has to do at some point who, who, who operates in more than one language. And that's almost everybody, right? Uh, it also in East Asia, they have to learn English. So, so I, I think there's, there's uh, disadvantages there as well. And of course, it leads to fragmentation too. So the solutions there, and this is something that I've uh, referred to before, the rise in China as an example, is really to try and connect and to some extent integrate open and commercially developed collections and methodologies to facilitate uh, research workflows. And my final slide, uh, this the teaching, and I think this could again be a discussion that we take up later because I think it's really an important question and I think it's one that we still struggle with individually, I think, because it, it really comes down to individuals at this point still uh, in many places. And, and, and this question of sharing best practices, I think that's implied in the question, is really important. Uh, because I think in the short term, that's really the solution to it, that, that we really have to share in this area as well. Uh, there have been, so to, 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 to address the first part of the question, there has been some recent curricular development, uh, but I couldn't really refer you to sort of a, a real set of best practices. Uh, there are online materials that uh, Donald Sturgeon, Paul Viertaler have put up, for example, uh, and there's also been, been programs and short-term schools. We organized a summer school, for example, at one point 
as well, where we integrate all the, the elements that I think are key in any digital humanity summer school or winter school, to be honest, that is start with some theoretical observations, what is the field, and then look at various approaches, uh, text analysis, topic modeling, visualization, database development. Uh, and, and working within your field with those sources, because that final part is also, I think, always really important. So people put, uh, we ask students to come up with a poster, uh, explain their research plan in which these digital methods would also be a component. So my, my, my final point here is, is really, is also proposal. And that is that uh, if we want to develop something like this or how to teach this, and we really have to because, you know, we're really running behind and, <clears throat> and this gap only get, it keeps getting bigger, is that we should be working on a set of modules that, that offers gradual introductions to, but also more advanced training in select methods. And we have specialists in many of these methodologies now. And if you could do something like you know, what the programming historian does, uh, you know, put, put up some material that people can then start with. I think we, we would be doing all of ourselves a, a, a real service. Uh, but ultimately, and I think this is this is also the real challenge, is that uh, it's not just about methods and, and sources, right? So we have to integrate this in humanities coursework and, and in language training uh, too. And, and that, uh, that is why this training is so important, because at this point, I think we, we really still uh, do not have the expertise to do this in a sustained fashion or the time. But of course, this is an, an entirely different uh, discussion as to you know, how uh, higher ed works uh, at this um, point. But these were some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with these questions, and I, I hope that we can uh, sort of, you know, uh, have a conversation based on some of these propositions and perhaps uh, get some uh, critical feedback from the audience on this as well. Thank you very much, Hilda, for a really wide-ranging uh, look at the evolution of um, developments and some really interesting proposals of the future. And there are lots of questions which come to mind, and I'm sure. We'll return to those in the interactive session afterwards. But let me move on now to our next speaker, um, Sui Li Kang from City University of Hong Kong. Uh, Li Kang Sui is assistant professor in the Department of Chinese and His History at the City University of Hong Kong, where he convenes a research cluster on digital society in its College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. He specializes in middle period Chinese history and culture, as well as the digital humanities. He's currently writing a book on Song Dynasty, Epistolary Culture, and planning another one on digital humanities in China. He currently teaches in English, Mandarin, and Cantonese, and he's the co-founder of Zero One Lab, an award-winning Chinese blog on digital humanities and culture. He also edits book reviews for cultural history. So over to you, Lik Lik Hang now. Thank you, Paul, um, for uh, this introduction and um, very much um, to you and uh, Naomi for inviting me to this event. I'm really happy to see some old friends and also to make some new ones here. So like, um, like Paul said um, when he introduced me, um, the context I'm working in is this. I teach in the Department of Chinese and History here in Hong Kong and I convene a, a research cluster on digital society. Um, and um, it spans across um, the humanities and social sciences. Um, and it's, it's um, sort of among um, the three um, clusters here. And I would not claim to know all that is happening in digital East Asian studies. Um, and what I know is certainly limited by what I'm doing and what I'm more uh, familiar with. So thinking through the questions that um, Paul and Naomi uh, sent me, um, and also um, they're up on the webpage, um, I, I think I'll be speaking about these things that I've uh, listed, um, these um, four uh, broad points here. Um, let me say a little bit about how I got into doing um, digital East Asian studies, or as I would frame it, I'm doing DH for my work on Chinese history more specifically. And I think this uh, would uh, serve as, as one humble example of how uh, researchers nowadays um, enter this exciting field. And also a way to share my observations about uh, the field more generally. Then I will uh, share a little bit about my recent work on tracing the engagement with uh, 
computers in uh, humanities work in this part of the world. And I'll also say some things about the current state of uh, DH in East Asian studies and in Asia, including indications that it is starting to become part of uh, the mainstream and also undergoing institutionalization. And depending on time, I, I'll see how, how much time I have um, to talk about the teaching of um, digital methods in um, this part of the world. Okay, so uh, first on my own um, exposure uh, to the digital field, um, thanks are special thanks are due to Hilda here, especially um, because it was when I studied with her for my doctorate um, that she provided uh, me with a lot of exposure um, to digital methods, including you know, text markup, um, tagging of text and TEI when I um, uh, took part um, in her project. Um, I think it dates back to 2010 or so. Um, and this was really my first formal um, engagement with uh, DH research, I would say. And so after the PhD, I became a uh, postdoc with uh, China Biographical Database, as, uh, or as we would call it, uh, CBDB. And it's uh, long running and uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, influential uh, Chinese studies DH projects. Um, and so when I was doing, um, and what I was doing for the project, um, you know, for several years, apart from digitizing data uh, from middle period China, was to promote digital research methods in, in China, since most of the user base uh, would be from uh, this part of the world. So that experience had me thinking about the state of the field um, in, in the greater China region more broadly, which really at the time was still taking shape. And the term DH had only been formally introduced um, to China and Taiwan around 2009. And, um, and then things began uh, picking up uh, around the mid uh, 2010s. So other than my uh, own you know, historical work, I also did um, uh, outreach events um, for the database. I organized workshops, conferences, talks, and taught courses on uh, DH in, in mainland China and Hong Kong, and um, to a much lesser extent, um, Taiwan, I guess. Um, because in Taiwan, there had already been much more um, going on in terms of digital uh, uh, humanities uh, based on their early developments in digitization for uh, digital archives and digital collections. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm showing the timeline um, of their various projects dating back to uh, 1998 and also ongoing um, until 2012. Um, so um, there have already been um, various um, uh, government sponsored, government led uh, and glam sector uh, digitization, um, digital archive projects um, in Taiwan. So by the time I um, finished the postdoc, moved back to Hong Kong about uh, four years ago, I think the field really was looking very, very different from what it was like when I first learned text markup, when I first you know, um, took part in Hilda's project on uh, notebooks in 2010. So after almost a uh, decade um, in the late 2010s, at least in the places where I usually operate and collaborate with in China, DH, is, DH was becoming the, the next big thing. Um, DH centers, uh, research centers are being set up in key institutions um, in China. Many more uh, publications uh, are discussing uh, DH. And I think most importantly, the DH community um, in China, which of course comes from multiple disciplines and subjects and, and work in you know, different cities in, uh, and institutions, of course, have taken shape. And we are able to find uh, various conferences and WeChat groups and even uh, journal outlets um, to discuss and showcase uh, what uh, DH scholars are, are doing. So being involved in 
in this, I, I am uh, very drawn to this uh, trajectory of DH research in, in the greater uh, China region. So I've been trying to, uh, to write about this um, and you know, so that we could give it some uh, anchors as for how we could think about uh, this trajectory. And um, I list uh, some of the, the work here. Um, um, so feel free to email me for these. Um, I won't have time to um, go over um, what I do in them, um, but basically I'm trying to analyze the past, the present, and also a and also a, a the vision um, for the future of uh, DH research in China and for Chinese studies, um, often with uh, my friends and collaborators and uh, colleagues. So first, you know, um, that's the, um, the, the past and, um, and uh, so I would call it uh, the prehistory of uh, DH in the uh, greater China region here. And of course, we all, you know, um, in the field, we all feel that DH research is often forward looking, right? Um, or at least we try to be, or even futuristic um, to some. But um, I wanted to flip it on its head and look at what the past uh, of DH research in China tells us about its current state and its future. And of course, um, uh, some other uh, DH scholars have already been doing this, um, been uh, tracing the roots of uh, DH and writing the histories of DH um, in the, the uh, Anglo uh, European world. And I think the Chinese part of this global story is also very fascinating. Uh, so a recent project that I'm uh, crafting is, is this, um, especially uh, from the 1970s, uh, 1970s onwards. And for this, it is a must to incorporate uh, mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and also uh, sinological circles overseas in the study of this, um, since the developments often flow towards and impact each other. So um, in this, I talk about uh, character encoding for Chinese characters um, and the history of that, which after the 1980s enabled large scale digitization uh, and processing of Chinese texts. And this began ushering the um, time when uh, some large scale historical texts uh, uh, have been established. Um, uh, Hilda already mentioned some of these, um, such as uh, Scripta Sinica at um, Academia Sinica in Taiwan of the 25 uh, dynastic uh, official histories. Um, and also from uh, the 1990s, the, uh, the Siku Chen Shu, um, uh, these used to be uh, CD ROMs. Um, uh, 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 created this project created by a Hong Kong company with uh, mainland collaborators. Um, and this uh, Siku Chen Shu um, you know, being the, so traditionally the go-to uh, source uh, for uh, Chinese humanists. You know, it, it is uh, an 18th century compendium of uh, 3000 uh, Primon books um, also. And so this era, um, dating from the 1980s and 90s uh, of data archive building and also uh, data accumulation um, is quite crucial, you know, especially until the 2010s. Um, I think it also, in a way, it also paved the, the, the way for the main dominant mode of digital research, especially for historians in the region which remain, I, I think, uh, rather rudimentary um, for quite some time in the 90s and the noughties and um, early uh, 2010s. Um, and that is uh, mainly the keyword searches of full text databases, especially you know, for these historical texts. And this is because the digitization of these big corpuses of so many thousands of books in digital collections made it so convenient um, to acquire research materials. And this probably prevented um, further utilization of data in um, other ways, in a sense. So you can see at um, 
um, at that time, um, uh, this so-called prehistory or the, the development of data sets and infrastructure of this period produced many of the path dependencies that impacted digital Chinese studies nowadays. Um, and some of the other analysis that I um, share in the article, I won't have time to introduce here, but the DH term, I think, um, I, I try to argue that um, it also gave these earlier preparation and explorations a new life and ignited new interest since the mid 2010s for China, especially when the term itself was introduced to China. And it attracted many more people um, entering uh, the field, uh, of course, including myself. Um, so if I could um, move on to the part about the scholarly achievements, right? Um, um, we are asked um, to think about those in recent years. If I could reflect on them very broadly, um, I think, of course, I, I'd only have time to give a bird's eye view of this, but especially before 2018, DH research um, in China still had quite limited visibility within mainstream humanities circles um, in uh, especially mainland China. And so many scholarly articles have appeared already before then, before 2018. Um, so according to a figure that uh, CJ uh, Chen Jing um, and I uh, cite in an article that uh, we wrote together, between these years, between 2010 and 2018, um, among the 344 articles that carried the keywords uh, Shu Zi Ren Wen, right, digital humanities in Chinese, in them, uh, 221 uh, were written by library science experts. So that's around 65%. Meaning that um, sort of uh, literary scholars, historians, and so on, were actually relatively marginal um, in this uh, leading up to 2018. But I think we could identify that um, juncture as a turning point um, in 2018 or so. Um, for the first time, several top journals um, in uh, Asian studies or in the humanities in China have published articles uh, that are works of digital scholarship. Uh, this would include uh, Journal of Asian Studies um, uh, in the US, um, in which uh, Hilda is uh, an editorial uh, member, so um, she knows uh, more about uh, this than I do. And also it includes um, uh, Li Shi Yanjiu, uh, Historical Research in Beijing, um, and also um, New History, Xin Shi Xue, um, in uh, Taiwan. So these are all uh, main, uh, sort of top mainstream journals in, in their own fields. And the articles that appeared in 2018, um, um, uh, for example, this one about uh, Northern Song antiquarian um, collectors um, and their networks, um, they featured their research findings, of course, but they also provided reflections on digital research methods. So I think this is an indication that DH research have begun to make way into first rate uh, scholarly uh, periodicals, which we all know has implications for the field, right? Um, for the incentive structures, for how uh, in institutions view this kind of work, um, that seemed elusive uh, to many, right, for quite some time. And, and other journals have also put out uh, special issues on uh, digital humanities and methods and so on, um, like uh, uh, you have mentioned. So, um, of course, we could trace some of this work to earlier publications as well. Um, and also uh, some uh, book series are also due to appear uh, in mainland China. Um, uh, some of us are uh, involved um, in these here. Uh, and uh, I think another trend, um, apart from this sort of going mainstream um, that is worth mentioning is the emergence of um, many digital research platforms that cater to uh, Chinese data. Um, and already mentioned um, here um, uh, earlier in the panel, so I won't um, uh, go into the details, but uh, certainly um, several uh, main ones. Um, that cater to Chinese data, including um, this uh, 
for uh, maps um, from Zhejiang. This one for uh, open data um, set up by the Shanghai Library um, for linked open data. Docu's guy at uh, National Taiwan, and also uh, uh, sort of a new research platform at Academia Sinica. And so these include um, functions you know, for scholars to manage and manipulate and visualize their humanities data. Most of these are open and allow users to load um, our own data. And, and some of these are proprietary, um, but most of them are open. And these certainly help scholars break away uh, from the previous habit of only um, um, uh, doing sort of uh, keyword searches in databases and not much more, right? The availability of these open platforms encourage us and other scholars to do more um, digital analysis and even um, visualizations and so on. But um, one point that I wanted to raise here is channeling data through these platforms is also not without its uh, sort of problems, I think. I hope from the outset that, um, okay, <laughs> what time, okay. Um, and that, well, from the outset that, um, uh, that you know, uh, developers of these platforms and its users will be aware of the importance of interoperability uh, and open access so that um, the platforms won't become another version, right, of data silos. And this is part of the reason why um, why uh, some of my uh, former colleagues at CBDB and I wrote that paper on um, uh, digital uh, research infrastructures for Chinese studies, to call for more awareness towards these issues uh, of connecting uh, research in uh, research data and platforms and tools and data sets uh, for Chinese studies. But I've um, really go been going on for too long. So I guess um, um, well, I won't have uh, much time to uh, talk about teaching, but feel free uh, to ask me about this. Um, uh, and I, I'm happy to, uh, to uh, speak about that as well. Um, I guess um, that's all from me for now. Um, and back to you, Paul. Thank you, Lin Kang, for a really, really thorough um, survey of all of the, the projects and initiatives. Really, really fascinating. And, uh, and you'll, I'm sure we'll, be, we'll expand on some of the points you didn't have a chance to get around to in the question. So thank you for that really great talk again. Um, and the next presentation, now we move on to the next, uh, the final present presentation, which will be from Kiyonori Nagasaki. Uh, from the International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo. Kiyonori is a senior, senior fellow uh, at the Inst International Institute, and his main research interest is in the development of digital frameworks for collaboration in Buddhist studies. He's also engaged in research into the significance of digital methodology in the humanities and in the promotion of digital humanities activities in Japan. His activities include postgraduate education in DH at the University of Tokyo, as well as a, a administration tasks of several in international digital humanities professional associations. And he's also engaged in international standards such as ISO, IEC 10646, Unicode, the TI and Consortium, IIF, IIIF, and um, in uh, all efforts to try and make sure that East Asian DH will be viable globally. So over to Ianori then for our last talk. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Paul. It's my great pleasure to be invited to this wonderful academic meeting. So uh, when I see the list of questions from Paul and Naomi, I thought that it would be useful to introduce our activities on international standards. It is just a practical but important matter for the method of digital humanities, such as uh, uh, methodological commons. So today I'm going to talk about the digital East Asian studies and international standards, a case of project of digital British studies. So, uh, today's agenda is here. First, I will introduce our British text database project called SAT site, uh, which is an acronym of Sanskrit word, Sanganiki Kuritam Taisho Triptakam that is Taisho edition of a series of Buddhist scriptures or canons. So next, um, 
I will mention some issues with sad faced, such as character encoding. I saw IC10646 and Unicode, and text encoding and TI guidelines. Then I will present a suggestion for digital research and studies as conclusion. So um, I will introduce SAT, uh, Daisokyo Texo Database Project. Um, it was established in 1994 and has been led by Professor Masashiro Shimoda in the University of Tokyo since 1999. He's a professor of Indian and Buddhist philosophy and the director of Digital Humanities Initiative in the university. I'm working in this project as a technical manager and a developer. The, the SAT project released a Buddhist text database including over 100 million Chinese, Japanese, and Indic characters on web in 2008, which was built in collaboration with over 200 researchers via web collaboration. After the release, the project has continued, uh, has continuously been improving the database in order to make a hub of international Buddhist digitization projects and services, such as electronic dictionaries, article databases, scripture databases, character databases, triple F images of digital fax means of manuscript and woodcut printings of the scriptures, and uh, text encoded, uh, so, uh, TEI encoded modern translations in the context of open science or public humanities. So uh, you can see most of the, the development of our project um, like this. And this is a website of the uh, project and the, the, the first version is still available he, here. And then the next version, um, it's uh, provided um, many uh, functions to, to um, align with other databases like this. And then after that, um, the, um, by inclusion of triple F functions, then, uh, we, we published the uh, uh, Buddhist icons database uh, by use of the triple F. Um, and then um, uh, here, here is the version uh, 2018, uh, it's also, uh, available and this is the latest version now. So users can see the text with the evidences or witnesses like this. Um, uh, released from various institutions by uh, Triple F. And then this is the, uh, so under construction version, um, to, so it will be released in this year, I hope. So during the improvement, the project faced many issues, especially on international standards. Then uh, we have addressed to solve some of them. I'd like to introduce two of them here. So first, character encoding. Uh, there were over uh, 6,000 characters which are not yet encoded in UCS Unicode, including many Chinese and some Indic and Chinese, uh, Indic and Japanese characters. So we developed a character database and a display system in the uh, first phase. So see here, um, this is a part of the character databases, including the evidence images. However, uh, as a system must treat our original coding on the display system, it was weak in interoperability and sustainability. Then um, we aimed to encode them in ISO IC 10656 and Unicode. Then the project, SAT project, participated in IRG 
ideographic research group in 2012. As the first organization in the group, the others are a kind of governmental bodies expected, uh, expect, sorry, ex except Unicode Consortium. As for Chinese characters, the IRG must manage character encoding. Then, that become a real member of ISO IAC JP71 SC2 to submit the proposals of Chinese character encoding officially. As a result, some index characters have been included in Unicode in 2015 in Unicode version 8. The other characters are managed by ISO IEC JTC1 JSC2 W2, not in IRG. So such kind of encoding characters for academic use are supported by SCI, Script Encoding Initiative in Berkeley. Then after that, the first 2,800 uh, 2, Chinese characters have done in um, 2017 in Unicode version 10 and, and so on. Then now uh, we continue to um, encode a few thousand characters with the name. So, and uh, um, so here, he, uh, this is a, a part of a proposal for uh, the, the character encoding. And then I, I'd like to introduce one more um, activity, text encoding. Uh, TEI, uh, Text Encoding Consortium, is a committee standards guidelines. Uh, so provides a committee standards guidelines for text encoding. Then uh, TEI guidelines were difficult to be adopted for East Asian materials because some semantics for East Asian texts were not included. Uh, there were very few examples for East Asian texts in the guidelines. That is, it was difficult for encoders. Then uh, we started to disseminate the issues among the DH researchers at the DH conferences and the TI members' meetings, that is, among Western DH people. After that, the special interest, interest group for East Asian Japanese text was established in 2016. This SIG has been promoting TI guidelines in Japan. Uh, comparing Japanese TI guidelines for Japanese and East Asian classics and modern text, developing TI encoded text and visualization tools, and discussing possible semantics and proposals in TI guidelines. Then, uh, as a result of the activities, uh, recently, uh, last month, Ruby Related elements which occur generally in Japanese text were implemented in TI guideline P5 version 4.2.0. So I think it denotes that the uh, marginal textual traditions of a large cultural area can be included in the guidelines if necessary. So, um, 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 here's an example of the um, Japanese guidelines for so for Japanese text. And then uh, here's a, a visualization tools for Japanese text in TEI. And, and this is the, the, the guidelines. Uh, so it, it explaining the Ruby annotation. So, uh, uh, there are many other international standards which can be utilized by digital East Asian studies. So, but uh, most of the past international standards were insufficient due to technical limitations. So, 
Uh, humanities in East Asia hadn't paid enough attention to international standards, but each project and small group had made original rules and formats, which were difficult in interoperability and sustainability. So according to imp improvement of technical availabilities, international standards seem to expand their adoptable scope in general. Humanities in East Asia should focus international standards so that we can treat our academic activities on digital infrastructures globally and sustainably. Because the digital resources would be useful not only for East Asian researchers, but also for global DH researchers if the resource would be compliant with the international standards. If you want to see more information, uh, please see here. So I, I will share uh, this slide after this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiyonori, for that very important review of um, open scholarship um, standards um, and the kind of the very necessary work in the underlying technical infrastructure, um, which is so so necessary for, for to carry out digital research. Um, I'm now that, that concludes the four uh, presentations. I think you'll agree four fantastic presentations. Uh, and we're now going to pass over to the interactive uh, section of the talk, which of the panel, which uh, my colleague Nomi Wells is going to chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, really interesting presentations and raised a lot of issues that we're seeing coming through in the questions. So we've got kind of four questions in the chat. Um, as I say, do also feel free to raise your digital hand to let us know if you'd like to ask a live question. And we can um, come to that after we perhaps address the kind of questions that came through in the chat, first of all. Um, so there's a few questions. Um, just to start off, the first question, uh, there are a few questions to Hilda, but I think some of them will be relevant to all of the pre present presenters and it'll be interesting to hear the view, but I think maybe the first one is very much for Hilda working in um, a European context about the challenges of international collaboration and in particular, so this is from Amanda Schumann and she talks about the issue, how do we get around the issue of collaboration if most funding often doesn't allow us to contract or hire people outside of our own local or national level. Um, so should we look at private funded collaborations and or should we look at um, just hiring people locally? So I think she's talking about the context of Germany, but I think it ap applies to a lot of mm -hmm. us. Um, and how do we go about finding ways to hire and pay people actually working in China or Asia or North America? So Hilda, if you wanted to respond on that one. Sure, and, and, and it certainly is, is, is a challenge, uh, I, although I do think that there's some uh, ways to deal with, with those challenges. Uh, so I, I followed Amanda's comments as well, and she, she posted a follow up to that as well. So I, I, the DFG, the sort of the German National Foundation, I have less experience with, so that, that would be one where I cannot um, entirely respond to. Uh, but I have a lot of the work that I ha have done has actually been sponsored by organizations such as the European Research Council. And that includes our collaborations with partners in uh, Taiwan, uh, the US, um, England and, uh, and China. So uh, I, I think in, I, I don't want to get in, into too much detail about how, how you work these things out, but as far as the European Research Council is concerned, as well as some of the national ones that I have dealt with, including the AHRC, but also the, the NVO, so the, the Dutch uh, version of that, uh, they have subcontracting rules that you can creatively use uh, and, and even actually legitimately use. I mean, by creatively, I do not mean that you're sort of going around the rules. You're actually working with the rules uh, to um, ensure that work that can be best done elsewhere because the expertise is elsewhere is funded uh, legitimately by partners in the region. So that, that is one way of doing it. So yes, you can work with uh, in uh, digital humanities centers and companies in the region, 
uh, you have to oftentimes so show that you've, you've made a legitimate attempt to, to look at expertise in various uh, places, but if that is, is the place where you need to go to do that kind of work, you can get it funded. Um, the other way, of course, is also that you can hire people from the region and bring them here. And this is an, uh, the second way in which we've, we've worked as well. Uh, and I've seen this happen also in Germany, for example, where uh, the, the Max Planck has brought in people uh, from, from Taiwan, uh, just hiring them. Uh, and, and arrangements can be can be made also to do that on a, on a time based time time delimited um, basis if need be. Um, so so there are I would say that actually um, you should look for ways to make that happen. And and normally you should be able to also go into conversation with the DRG, for example. If, if you're not quite sure, talk to them to see whether there is no solution for this. Brilliant. I think the the kind of all the questions kind of touch on this challenge of collaboration. Um, and the next question, it arises from the technical challenges that Hilda mentioned, but I think um, all of the presentations really addressed this issue. So it's the question of, you know, tools and standards, whether we have local and the kind of global cooperation and the challenges there. So Vincent asks, regarding the technical challenges, do you think it would be more promising to have developers of different yet similar tools work together to create even more capable tools, encouraging global cooperation in the process, rather than having several tools with similar functions? Or is the diversity of tools a blessing in the long run? And I think any of our speakers might want to come in on this because I think it was addressed in all the presentations. Yeah. Do, do you want me to go first, or, or do you want? Yeah, if you want to go first, yeah. and then we'll. Sure. Um, and I think I mean this, this may be a sound as a cop out, but it's a little bit of both, uh, really. So that I think the processes of collaboration uh, that I hinted at in in my in my talk have actually come from this sort of engagement that uh, Vincent, I'm actually not quite sure what the full name is, has suggested that it, indeed it is really important that uh, developers, uh, designers from these uh, various projects talk to each other. Uh, and that is actually what has resulted, uh, the examples are that on, on all sides, so, so Marcus uses various uh, products, but the, our other collaborators, CTAX, CBETA, DocuSky, uh, uh, Academy of Korean Studies, they also sort of pull, pull us in. So, so it's pretty much uh, that kind of a process that has led to these, these sorts of collaborations. I think the question hints at, you know, should, should there be even more of this? Probably. It's not always easy to do this, though. So in practice, you will learn that collaboration is always oh, sounds good, but it can be very time consuming because, of course, everybody is within their own context and may not necessarily have the time, the funding to, to, to do uh, the kind of collaboration that you would like to see. Physical distance, in addition, can actually also make it more difficult. So, so I would say definitely worth investing in it. I think it does deliver better results in the end, but uh, it's not to be underestimated what it takes to, to make this, this happen. At the same time, I do think that preserving diversity, even if there's some overlapping functionality, also has its uses. Um, I, I think that, yes, there are various text annotation tools, but oftentimes I think researchers develop on the basis of what they would like to do. And oftentimes these things are not replicated then in, in some of, of the other uh, tools that, that are uh, accessible. So I would say, you know, that. Oftentimes to get to a point where you say, okay, we should have all this functionality and this would be a great platform that comes from having that kind of diversity. So I would not want to um, take that away either. Great, thanks. I think is any, I think did Likang, did you want to come in? That's right. Yes, if I could add um, just one point to uh, what um, Hilda just said. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, the diversity um, that um, uh, is and the concern here is also quite important. Um, so several years ago, when I was still with CBDB, we were thinking hard about sustainability issues, right? And um, having that uh, diversity of tools, um, even if the, you know, even if part of the collaboration falls through, or even if some parts of the collaboration um, no longer gets funded. I think that kind of diversity is um, conducive. It's, it's good for uh, sustainability in the long run. And um, I think uh, projects that um, have been running for some time um, uh, 
will uh, have experience with this and um, you know um, need to think hard about this issue. Okay, I think, sorry, CJ, I just realized you, I think- No, because I dropped <laughs> off. Sorry. Because the internet, yeah. So yeah, I, I would like to address a little bit more to this question because uh, just like Held mentioned earlier about the data uh, controlling over things. I think for the method, it's not only about the tour development, but it's also about data set, the training data set sharing. Uh, like me, I'm doing the image recognition um, with, uh, with uh, technicians and statisticians. But the problem is when we started to use some uh, developed tool or methods in the other you know, uh, fields based on the photographs or other images, we found it's really difficult to directly apply to the Chinese you know, images. So, but the problem is not just about the method because sometimes the method or tool is very easily to be developed, but difficulty lies into the data set. So we have to train or to collect the data from the beginning. And, uh, um, but, but the problem is for a lot of technicians, they don't want to waste time on you know, data collecting and, uh, and the labeling because that's, uh, that's really time consuming things. But for us, after we, we did that, we have done a lot of you know tagging and labeling uh, works, but we cannot uh, open all this data set to the public because the copyright issue, especially for for the images, because for the tags we know for some Asian you know tax is out of the copyright you know uh, protection, but for the image archived and uh, preserved by the museums, they would like not release copyrights to the public or even researchers so that i think if we want to establish a kind of collaboration we have to resolve this issue from the data uh, resource so that's my response yeah okay uh Kianone, did you want to come in um... Uh, so um so i so I, I don't know the, the situation of entire East Asia, but uh, so, I, I, so I'm strongly involved in the Japanese governmental um, DH activities. So, 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 so the, the recently, um, so we, we are uh, 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 serving the, the E, so U European Research Infrastructure Consortium and the, the DARIA uh, clearing to, to make the data infrastructure and sharing the, the tools for um, digital humanities. So, so we in particular, uh, so, so, um, so uh, think the, the Japanese and the Ch almost Chinese um, materials um, to to you to be utilized. So um, so many so th there are many projects uh, which uh, develop the, the data and the tools for digital studies um, for cultural materials in Japan. So we now now we are. Um, we are so forming a kind of a platform for for sharing the information among so so Japanese and uh, foreign uh, DH researchers, uh, especially uh, re re research for Japanese culture. So, however, so so I I hope uh, our activities should uh, uh, our activities will connect and inter. So um, co uh, collaborate with other countries in East Asia. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Great, yeah, I think the um, complex question, but um, definitely opportunities for 
collaboration and um, sharing those best practices, which connects again to this next question, um, which is specifically about the role of libraries in terms of supporting DH research. And this can be libraries and archives, I think more widely as well. Um, so this is from Cosima Wagner. So Cosima is a Japanese studies scholar working um, in a Berlin University library. And so she has asked, um, following on Hilda mentioned some best practices. So the examples of the Staats Bibliothek, uh, the Max Planck Institute on Rise and Shine. Uh, Cosma asks, are there any other examples of best practices in mind? Or if not, what, what do you expect from libraries or what could libraries provide in terms of providing more support to researchers um, doing kind of digital East Asian studies research? So would anyone, I think, again, any of our speakers might, I'm sure, have had experiences working for um, trying to get support from libraries and archives. So um, Hilda, do you want to start again? Sure, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface those by saying <clears throat> that I, I started after I, I did my PhD, I worked in the library for three years, and that's when a lot of this started to, to happen. So I, I and I've tried to maintain those connections with the library community uh, by linking to the Council on East Asian Libraries as, as a site and an organization that I'd like to refer to because they have been having this discussion for a long time. I, I know in general, library organizations have been devoting special issues to digital scholarship, to how to engage with uh, a teaching. Uh, of course, digital humanities uh, for them is part of digital scholarship uh, because they have to serve other constituencies uh, in, in the sciences uh, as well. Uh, it's, so it's, it's a huge question and I can only just offer some pointers that I think are, are important. Um, and I'll, I'll start by admitting that initially I have mainly knocked on the, the library's door to um, particularly raise, raise the point about sustainability and infrastructure. Uh, because for us, it is, uh, if, if us and then I'm again referring to you know, scholars who develop either databases or tools. Um, if, if it's something that has clearly shown that it still currently is being used by a sizable uh, community or that it's key to even a small uh, community of scholars, then I think it is important that we say when a project ends that we can find um, some partner, the, and the library is, I think is a good partner, uh, in part because we trust the library not to throw out things just like that. Um, there has to be a good reason, be typically, before a library throws something out. And I, uh, when you have a service, something like like Marcus, the text annotation tool that thousands, uh, we have over 10,000 uh, users registered. We, we have more when we, we take into account the users in China. Um, then we would like you know, to be able to say, you know, after five or 10 years when the funding ends, can you make this part uh, of, of a sort of archive kind of, of service, maybe offer still some room for, for a future development. Um, and, and I think this is a conversation that, that, that is, is difficult, but needs to happen. And we totally understand, of course, that for libraries, it's important to be able to adhere to some standards to also um, you know, tell us what is acceptable, what not, because you cannot have expertise in all programming languages, for example. Um, but I, just as you, a library has for, for a long time been sort of the, the guardians of the materials we produce research-wise, this is also what we do in research. And so it has to come up with ways to also offer access to these kinds of uh, productions. This is, this is the first area, so infrastructure and thinking about how to facilitate tools and, and other kinds of digital products that we develop. A second one is, is uh, teaching, um, and, and this may sound uh, odd perhaps, but I, th I think libraries probably have been um, not been given as much space to be part of our teaching uh, as they should have. and. Um, students work in the library. Uh, the more advanced they get, the more true this, this is. And so it makes sense that, that also from, from the side of, of, of teachers that we kind of teach where the, where, where the research is happening, right? And, and so 
uh, I, I think in terms of backpack, you do see actually a lot of uh, libraries have been developing sort of centers for digital humanities, center for digital scholarship, where they do engage in collaboration for, for teaching. And I would say that's, that's something that should only continue. I think there's certainly still sort of issues of expertise there that, that need to be negotiated. Um, but it's important, I think, also on the librarian side to maintain that connection to what's happening in, in, in teaching and research to be able to develop the services that are going to be taken up because that's perhaps one one area of caution and then i'm quite enthusiastic but sometimes the inclination is to go with things that are already out there so we, we already have this so why don't you use this and that doesn't always answer the question of, that a teacher or a researcher has so to some area of flexibility thinking along i think is, is important in these discussions as well and then the third area the last one that i'll mention is co-development I think librarians have expertise that we do not have. <laughs> you know, we tend, I, I think with the exception of Kiyonori, for example, we are not trained in standards or we're not keeping up with standards uh, the way we should. Like this, I think this is expected of, of libraries um, and uh, there, but also in other areas, I think in the Central Digital Scholarship tend to hire people with very strong infrastructure development skills. And, and I think there too, it, it would be great. And I say co-development very intentionally uh, because I, I think it is really important that uh, all sides participate in the conversation here. So that uh, teachers and, and, and uh, scholars sort of develop themselves, but at the same time kind of make requests on that basis to, to develop things that are applicable for, for the humanities. Brilliant. Are there any other comments on libraries and archives for many of the other panelists of, of their role in research? Yeah, may, yeah. may I mention a little? So, so I recommend to uh, use a kind of a triple uh, annotation on services. So, so, so because the triple F is much more popular in Western materials such as medieval manuscript. But then, so you can relatively easy, easily uh, get support from the uh, technicians in libraries. So, so it provides a various collaborative environment uh, for by so for so you, you, you using using the digitized materials in library. So already the, the um, Munich, uh, the library in Munich uh, already provides the um, East Asian digital library in uh, by use of triple I. So so I hope uh, your library also use it. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, I think libraries are definitely a key partner in research. Um, did uh, Likang or CJ, did you have any further comments on libraries? Yeah. CJ? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> First, uh, libraries actually, it's uh, uh, here oh, in China, at least, I think the library role plays a really important role in the digital humanities. And, uh, uh, but still, it's about, is there is a kind of a, uh, another issue about the um, uh, kind of a dominated, you know, discipline between the library or information science and other disciplines, uh, because here, at least in our system, education system, the discipline is very important. It's about the resource distribution and also kind of a, a syllabus and uh, all the uh, teaching uh, things. So actually, <laughs> there, it, it, I think there is has been a long time about debates between if we should have a discipline of digital humanities. But now the library science, or uh, in our you know educational system, at least in our university, uh, they already started to establish a discipline only under the discipline of a. Uh, uh, library or uh, information science. That's a big challenge for the humanities, for other disciplines. So that, that's kind of a, not really balanced things, but it's uh, still about negotiation between the different disciplines. How can we uh, deal with those kinds of issue? So it's not really relative to this topic, but I just want to add a little bit of commentary on this. 
Lekhanka, I think. And if I got, yes, uh, thank you. If I could just uh, add one uh, quick uh, explanation to uh, what CJ had just said, and it is that um, the Chinese Academy is, is structured in uh, the way that um, that there, there is an official authorized list of disciplines and the funding system orbits around it. So when DH becomes a hot topic or you know an emerging field, uh, the various disciplines also try to take it as its own. Um, and of course, this you, know, you would feel that it goes against uh, the uh, cross-disciplinary and um, collaborative nature of the field, but that you know that part of this is the uh, institutional arrangement um, for many of the uh, centers of gravity that we see in uh, China for DH. And as for my um, thoughts about uh, you know, the question itself um, about the role of libraries, um, my, my views mainly come from my collaborations actually for, uh, with uh, the uh, Peking University Library uh, when I was uh, based there um, for, for half of my postdoc. So one example of how libraries could partner with DH researchers and projects is to think about what synergies there could be for DH capacity building and training, especially because libraries are user facing and sometimes they actually uh, know more about the existing resources, uh, of course, in terms of collection, but also in terms of uh, subscriptions to resources, um, to uh, the digital tools, to uh, the software um, available. And very importantly, they also know a lot about the needs of patrons and users, especially beyond the students that we ourselves teach. So what we see in the, um, the, sort of the main centers of DH activity in mainland China, and to some extent in Hong Kong here, is that libraries are becoming contact zones and even uh, physical meeting places for DH scholars and practitioners. And uh, so one uh, prominent example um, uh, beyond uh, the Peking University Library is that comes to mind include the Shanghai Library, which itself has a fantastic uh, Chinese uh, genealogy uh, collection that's, uh, that's uh, very, very large. And they're quite open to the digital utilization of their collections. But they also have been very active in sharing data, taking part in uh, linked open data initiatives for Chinese history based on their own bibliographic records, uh, biographical uh, records, and so on. And also um, active in facilitating exchanges between uh, DH scholars. And in fact, um, I think it was last year, right? Um, uh, it's in 2020 um, when the Chinese annual DH conference um, uh, was hosted by, by them um, in the uh, Shanghai Library. And that's all for me. Brilliant. Um, yeah, really interesting reflections on the role of libraries. Um, I think there have been a lot more questions, but I noticed CJ and Nick Hang and Kianori, you've responded to a lot of those in the chat, which has been really active and really interesting. So um, I think thanks for such, um, to all four of you for really fascinating presentations, which as you can see, have raised a lot of discussion. So um, obviously I think this isn't, there's, it, it shows us so much more scope as well for further kind of discussion and events, which I'm sure all of you are taking forward in your own work and research activities. Um, so thanks to all of our speakers and to the audience as well for some fantastic questions and engagement. Um, we really enjoyed hosting this event. So the digital modern languages, we obviously have a very broad remit in what we cover. Um, but as you'll see, what we really aim to do is to explore and kind of bring kind of greater discussion around digital research beyond English speaking context, which is useful, but can be quite dominating in terms of how we discuss DH. So this has been 
really important to show the different there's a lot of shared issues that we all face in different language areas but it's also really important as we've done today i think to address the different cultural and linguistic dynamics that are in play and the specific local issues that we've seen highlighted today um so thanks from myself and paul spence um who we convened this series together so thanks for every to everyone for joining us um as i said we will make a recording of the event available on our YouTube channel in the next um, couple of weeks or so. And we also hope you might be interested in joining us for future Digital Modern Languages events. I think Paul has posted a link to our website and that's where we will announce an, all of our events. The next seminar that we have coming up is going to be on Wednesday the 12th of May and we've got Miriam Hawke um, from Open University um, talking about linguistic, cultural and digital hegemonies in virtual exchange, which again will address similar but also different themes to some of the questions we've discussed today. Uh, we'll open registration again for that after Easter, but if you follow our website or our Twitter account, Digimod Lang, um, that's where you'll see us announce all of those events. Uh, so I think that's everything, and unless Paul has anything else to say, um, but yeah. Thanks very much and good. Have a good day or a good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you, Nami. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone.